Jim Drake. I'm from the University of Zurich, and I am also the, or I teach internet governance, and I am also the chair of the non-commercial users constituency in ICANN. This is workshop 282, Internet Telecom Convergence and Global Internet Governance. And I'm happy to see you all here. I know there's a lot of other things going on at the same time, including a, an interesting uh, debate about prison. But we have some interesting things to debate here as well. Um, I'll just briefly, the genesis of this workshop, um, and I must say I'm very happy. It's the my eighth and final one of the week, and so and it's the one that I've been looking forward to the most. Um, uh, it's a topic that has been eating at me for a while. Um, I myself started my career, uh, while I'm a political scientist, I started my career studying international telecommunications arrangements, and I spent a lot of time around telecommunications, regulatory, and standards type institutions. Um, and when the internet took off in the early, uh, as it in the early 1990s, I was based at the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva doing research there and offices they, they provided. Um, and um, I remember that the, the reaction of a lot of people on the staff and some of the people from the national delegations to the internet was quite negative. Um, and they sort of presented it as, uh, well, they alternately viewed it as an academic plaything or um, or a plot to destroy PTTs and undermine the open system interconnection model, uh, or various other things. Of course, all those things were true, actually, as it turned out. But, um, the, but the, the, there was a sort of not invented here kind of mindset. Uh, and over time, as the internet took off, um, I found more and more, both at the international level and at the national level, that there was a lot of differences of view about the internet uh, in the telecom world. Um, governments uh, at the national level and international institutions struggled to figure out how the telecom world and the internet world related to each other. We used to talk a lot, if you remember, about net heads versus bell heads, for example, and so on. There's different ways of seeing the world. And um, it was always very complicated, I, I thought. And, and uh, everybody has struggled for solutions to this. Last summer, when I was at the Asia Pacific Internet Governance Forum, um, I was uh, uh, at a, in Tokyo. I went to a meeting, uh, a strategy meeting with um, a bunch of government officials, uh, and there was a discussion about the upcoming World Conference on in International Telecommunication, and the question of whether or not the ITU's um, definition of the internet and the ITU's jurisdiction. Uh, naturally covered, uh, uh, sorry, of telecommunications, uh, the definition of telecommunications naturally covered the internet, and I was told, yes, of course it does. And I thought, wow, that's a very interesting view coming from a senior policymaker in the third largest uh, economy in the world and major OECD player. Um, and I, when we went to the wicket negotiations in Dubai, we heard that from many other players as well. The, the view that indeed the, this, and the distinction is artificial, internet is really a part of the telecom world, the regulatory institutions, standards, processes, and so on associated with uh, the telecommunications world increasingly would apply to the internet and these things would converge together. Um, undoubtedly that would be a difficult and contested sort of process of convergence. And so I thought it would be good to use the occasion of the IGF, where all topics are fair game, to look at that uh, interrelationship between those two worlds and say, well, what might it mean for the global governance of the internet? Um, how do we see the trajectory of that relationship and, and how would it relate then to the search for international rules of the game that so many people uh, say we need more and more in different contexts? So that's what this workshop is about. The workshop is co-sponsored by the University of Zurich, the Non-Commercial Users Constituency, the Association for Progressive Communication, the Internet Society, and the Public Interest Registry. The speakers are as follows, and we've had some churn due to unfortunate uh, uh, events with people not being able to fly to Bali due to the late agreement to hold the event and so on, but we have a very good panel. 
We have um, Ms. Fiona Alexander, who is the Associate Administrator and Head of Office for International Affairs at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration in the U.S. Department of Commerce, the U.S. Government Agency. We have Mr. Yaya Arco, who is an expert on Internet architecture and Ericsson Research and the Chair of the Internet Engineering Task Force from Finland. Somebody knows a little bit about Internet technology. Uh, another person not in the dark on that topic is Avri Doria. She's an independent consultant and the former chair of the GNSO Council in ICANN. She's from the U.S. Uh, we have next to me Mr. Michaela Bellavit. He's the chair of the Digital Society Working Group at the European Telecommunications Network Operators uh, Association. And he works for Telecom Italia in Italy. And uh, seated now next, <laughs> happily, is uh, Teresa Swinehart. Teresa is now a senior advisor to the president on strategy at ICANN, but when um, I asked her to do this, she was working for a telephone company, Verizon, so that was part of the thinking of having her there. And wandering around in the back with a cup of coffee is our remote moderator, which is um, <laughs> Ed Esther Verizon, the executive director of the Association for Progressive Communication, whose views I would also welcome on this topic should she like to get in on the conversation. So anyway, that's, um, that's the layout. We're going to look at the relationship between those two worlds. We're going to start with uh, each of the panelists offering sort of four to five minute uh, basic positions on, um, on the issues as they're explained. There is a working paper, a background paper uploaded to the website, which has the questions, the discussion questions, and the background text for this event. You're welcome to download it. So they'll, they'll do a quick um, tour, tour of the tab and go through uh, laying out some basic positions, and then we'll have a discussion around some questions that I pose to them in the group. So, that said, uh, let's begin. Uh, and I guess we might as well go in order uh, alphabetically. So, Fiona, perhaps we could start with you. Should I sit next to you or behind you? Sit behind I'm sorry? You. you don't want to start? Well, would you like to guest? Would somebody else, Larry, would somebody else like to start? Who'd like to start? We'll just pass the talking stick to whoever wants to go. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm Teresa Swinehart. I'm, I'm now with ICANN, but when I um, agreed to be on this panel, I was with Verizon. Uh, so I'll bring sort of a, a different perspective. Uh, so I was a little late. Sorry about that. Um, lost track of time, but there's a relevance to why this is um, to this conversation had actually misplaced my phone. So from that perspective, it also caused me to think how reliant we are on these devices for a multitude of purposes. Uh, and how we use these devices, uh, not just for keeping track of our contacts and various other things, but also looking at documents. So I think what we're facing right now is that we are in a situation where there is no industry that's not touching the internet in some capacity. Um, but as users, we are also becoming more reliant on small things that are easy to misplace. Uh, but they're not, no longer small things for a phone call, but they're actually small things for a multitude of activities that we have uh, in our day-to-day -day activities. But it's not just the phone or the communication or the laptop, but it's also automobiles and devices in homes and security systems and all sorts of other things. And so we, as we look at the dialogue around convergence, it's also the dialogue around the multitude of things that are touching the internet and how the policy frameworks around those are really quite interconnected across a range of stakeholders and across a range of industry sectors. And so as we're looking at developing policies or as we're looking at dealing with issues around privacy or security or IP networks or telecommunication networks, we actually have to incorporate into that the fact that this communications medium, which was traditionally used for one aspect, is now touching just a multitude of things in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and from that perspective, need to be taking a different perspective on it. And that also means that we need to be working with new players and um, how to look at developing and evolving frameworks uh, to address the new interest areas, uh, the new entities that touch on this, and finding new ways to engage uh, and build on existing ways to engage to solve um, areas that impact it. So it's not directly related to the points in the paper, but I think it's relevant to the discussion. 
So maybe I'll um, continue. My name is Yari Akko, chair of the ITF, uh, based in Finland. And um, as I looked at the, uh, the, the you know the write up for for this workshop on the on the web, it, it seemed that it's quite focused on you know, various wicked negotiations and governance and treaty discussions. And let me just say that that's not necessarily where I'm personally coming from. I, I don't have a lot of experience on that. I'm not the expert in that. My perspective comes mostly from working in the telecoms industry, and, and that industry has, for a good part of the last two decades, been involved in this convergence process. And, and, and by and large, um, the industry has seen the light and is well positioned to continue its existence in the new form that it has, has gotten to. Um, I'm just making one observation here. Uh, the, um, you know, just look at like how fast the smartphone revolution and people's usage pattern changes have been. And then another uh, observation that the you know, the general uh, financial health of the telecoms industry is, is pretty good, I claim. And I won't go into average, average revenue per user numbers, but new does not necessarily mean bad. Um, and uh, and then I want to analyze this a little bit further um, the, the the convergence topic. Um, when, when we say convergence. Depending on circumstances, we could mean like a you know, marriage of equals or, or more of a revolution, perhaps in some some case. And, and I think we have that case here, actually. So it's it's more of a big change than than uh, you know an equal uh, marriage. And, and when something changes dramatically, it usually means that the rules that, that we had used to have for some, something else is not not so applicable anymore. It used to be the case that distance mattered, for instance. I don't think it does anymore, at least not so much. It used to be the case that you had a very small number of players, like one country you might have had only one telecoms entity, um, you know, state-owned perhaps and large. Today there's a large number of players from different categories in every place, large operators, content providers, small operators, corporations, and even individuals. So the, the playground has really changed dramatically. And it used to be also the case that we we're administering scarcity. We no longer are, uh, although some of us may actually lose sight of that when we're, you know, setting up new links to poorly served areas, for instance, or when we deal with difficult things like uh, the IPv4 address amount or TLD allocations. Um, but the, I think if you look at the big picture, the truth is still that there's very few real limits. Benefit keeps on growing. Um, you know, price of equipment and price of uh, bandwidth keeps going down. The internet technology allows near infinite creation of various spaces. Um, we we all are very focused on you know in, in these kinds of forums on you know names and numbers, for instance. But um, but I'm not sure if the users will really perceive it this way. You know, there's you know, infinite infinite number of new things and spaces that can be created very easily, you know, hashtags and, and so, such. So it's not, not so much about you know uh, limited resource anymore, um, and this is not to say that we don't work on we don't work on addresses or, or many other core things that, that the internet really you know fundamentally needs. But I wanted to show that the nature of the internet technology is very different from what telecoms used to be, and um, will there be debates about how revenue is shared between different players in the business ecosystem? Of course there will be. There always is. Um, but does that mean that we should add a models develop for something very different? Definitely not. And this is not to say that there isn't some convergence and adoption of the old things, quote unquote. Um, but um, but it's not that we start from them. We need to look at the new world and we'll add up certain things in, in specific areas and when Example areas, emergency calls and voice over IP. You know, how should we deal with that? That's an important thing to discuss. But um, the world has changed, but so that's what I have to say. Okay. Um, for a while, I worked for a company, did research for a company that was actually working on all this convergence, next generation network, and all that. And I thought about the word convergence for a long time. And at a certain point, I decided I thought it was nonsense. 
um, because really there were two separate entities. There was the telecommunications, and for a while the Internet did layer itself as a service on top of the telecommunications, but it was really just an application on top of that service. And then at this point, we started to have the Internet as, as something that existed in itself and was not dependent necessarily on telecommunication services, though sometimes it did share the same infrastructure. It was indeed a different service that people might uh, layer telephony on top of. So then starting to look at the notion of voice services versus telephony. And when I look at the Internet, I certainly don't see it as a telecommunications system. It is something different. It was once layered on top of telecommunications. It now allows telecommunications type services to be layered on top of it. Uh, so when I look at all of the regulatory systems that came out of the telecommunications industries, I think that by and large they do not relate at all to anything that one might call the Internet. Now, th there's, there's a slight caveat in all of that. I would certainly say that extends to anything that's voice services on the Internet, whether it's, you know, the voice over IP or some of the other variants that have been more proprietary. Those are Internet services, and they are not telecommunications and, and should not in any way be subject to telecommunications regulation regimes. On the other hand, there are telecommunications entities that have decided to move their telecommunications infrastructure to a IP packet-based type of network that is separate and stands alongside the Internet. So it is not the Internet. It is telecommunications using IP. And in that case, yes, you still have telecommunications, and I would think that the regulatory framework would apply to telecommunications that uses IP as, as its medium. But to try and confound the two and sort of say that telephony services on top of the Internet are in some sense telecommunications, I think misses the point that they are a different service, that they are not bound by those regimes, just as the Internet itself should not be bound by those regimes. But indeed, if a telecommunications company says, I am going to build myself an IP network that I control that is not a global, you know, uh, everyone can connect to everyone. And then, for example, I have a, what people have called, you showed your phones. But when I come here, I can't use my phone. I can use it as an IP device where, yes, I can get some telephony services or some voice services, rather, on top of it. But because of roaming and all the other insanity that people are imposing upon the telecommunication services so that everybody can make their bucks, I cannot use it as a phone and can't consider it a phone. It is a, a, an IP device that uses networks, that allows me some voice services and, and such. So I think we really need to keep the two very separate and recognize those cases where telephony, telecommunications is just something that happens to be instantiated using IP. Thanks. Um, okay, so maybe I'll just be brief. This is a Fiona just for your transcript. Um, and maybe speak to a little bit more of a policy perspective than some of the more technical presentations that have been made. I think, you know, uh, the paper that Bill put together for the workshop really sort of highlighted the tensions uh, that have been around for a while and the wicket that was the latest incarnation of that and, you know, conversations ongoing since then continue to demonstrate that. And I think these tensions are inevitable just because of the history of the networks. So the traditional telecom network and system uh, government sanctioned, government monopolies, um, depending or government-owned companies, depending on the world that you lived in, where you had to have an intergovernmental network and solution to develop things, versus the internet, the public internet that Avery is describing, which was developed by people like Yari and Avery and others, and was permissionless and ad hoc and decentralized. And what you're happening, what you're seeing is as these worlds are, are, are not merging, but I would say as um, you know, they become substitutable, which is what Aubrey is describing as her, her using her phone here. So as 
um, an IP-based network becomes substitutable for a traditional telecom network, you see these tensions sort of, uh, you know, become a little bit sharper. And then you also see governments wanting to understand what's their role in the system here. Um, this idea that, um, that the ITU, the jurisdiction of the ITU covers these things, you know, is challenging. I think uh, different member states have different views. They're allowed to have different views, obviously, and different interpretations of, of definitions. But I, it, I find it challenging to understand and accept how a definition that I think was most recently updated in the 1950s, which is, I, I believe, in the last definition of telecom was updated in the ITU, could cover something that wasn't yet created. So this is just a hard uh, argument for me to understand when we sort of go through these exercises. Um, but maybe I'll leave it at that. Uh, yes, my, my name is Michele Bellavita for the records. And uh, I, I think I will uh, do some reflections around three main points. Um, first of all, I've gone through your paper, Bill. I think it's very interesting and it raises really a number of um, very interesting points we have to look at. Um, reacting to your, not to your, um, to your point, from, an Europe, from a European perspective, the, the situation we face in Europe is slightly different from that of the US because, as you know, broadband in Europe is a tele considered a telecom service and not an information society service. So the kind of scenario we look at is slightly different. Um, but then, uh, that's the first reflection. I would like to um, to tell you a bit what we're thinking about within ATMO as European telecom industry and the reflections that we're doing together with the European Commission and uh, very soon with the European Parliament as well. Um, we find ourselves confronted in situations where telecom regulation in Europe as around the world, basically, has been developed under the three main areas of interconnection, access, and universal service, and uh, uh, has been translated into legislation in terms of rights of consumers and in terms of obligations for service providers. So that's the situation. And now if we look uh, at how the Internet has evolved and OTT services, Internet services, we now have another set of policy hours that we have to look at, which is not like regulating wholesale input to bring down prices and granting access to competitors. And all these new areas um, that are very, very a la mode today are privacy, data protection, security, also in terms of national security, copyright, liability. So we've got a set of rules applying to telecom services as defined in the ITU telecom classification and in the European framework as well. And then we've got a new set of areas that are applied for new services, but also to telecom services. Uh, so when we speak about convergence, I think we have not to be too speculative and uh, um, just making debates over terms that we don't understand very well. Let's try to look at things very precisely. We've got a number of rules that are worth for a segment of the whole value chain, another number of rules that are worth for OTT services. Um, what do we mean when we say we would like to reach a level playing field? We definitely do not want to say that we want regulation, that today very hard regulation that today applies to the telecom sectors to be applied to OTT services. Definitely not. Well, uh, over the top services, like internet services, or the services that run over the top. Uh, like not PS, PSTN, uh, best telephony, but rather, I don't know, anything like Skype or Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, uh, any sort of service that runs over the network. Um, the American, that, that you said so. <laughs> but, um, so when, when we argue we need a level playing field, the, 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 the question that we are asking ourselves is, can we keep going in the next 10 years uh, with this division of rules, or is it beneficial and better for everybody along the value chain to look at how things are and how 
the best craft policies so that the internet really becomes better and better and more widespread. And it's interesting to note that the European Commission also points to these um, to these issues in the very recent communication adopted in September, they look at the future review of the, of the overall ICT policies, uh, also in terms of uh, reviewing, reaching the level playing field between the rules that apply to over the top online services compared to telecom services. So we, we really want to contribute to the debate, look at how things are, and try to to see whether we can work together and find a good way forward. Um, probably, uh, probably that's something we really need to um, think, begin thinking as of today to give a precise meaning to the word convergence. What does it mean? Where does it apply to? And what's the best way out for everybody? So a few points, but then I'm happy to try and answer questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if our remote moderator who had, does a lot of work around telecom issues wish, would, might want to make any kind of a comment of her own? Yes? You would? Okay. Is that one working? Did you figure out how to turn it on? Huh, there's more. All right. Can you give that young lady mic? This is Henriette Estrahuizen. I'm Henriette Estrahuizen, APC. Thank you, Bo. I think, uh, I can't find a good analogy, but I think we're talking about, it's a little bit like talking about who's controlled the shipping lanes when most freight is being transported by air already. And so, I mean, two points. I think, I think the, in the whole sort of wicket, um, it, how it was approached, I think um, some of the, the potential uh, benefit that could come from a more open approach to these murky layers of convergence was lost. Um, and I'll give one example, and that's Afri's example. Many people in the world are still accessing the internet through telecommunications networks or systems or platforms that are governed by telecommunications regulation. And should we not be exploring how internet and attitudes in internet governance and, and development can influence that? So shouldn't, as an internet community, instead of telling the ITU, you know, get out of our backyard or our front yard, tell the ITU, why don't you regulate, why don't you issue guidelines um, to ensure that roaming and, and, and uh, roaming and the other thing is the mobile buy-in systems. What is that called? We don't have that in South Africa. It's illegal. But well, you can only use, you can't put a SIM card from another network in your mobile phone. What's it called? Lock in, lock in. And so why don't we engage with the ITU and say, please issue guidelines to national regulators to stop these types of regulations which actually limits people's access to the internet. So I think, I think there's a lost opportunity uh, resulting from the paranoia of the ITU is going to take over the internet. Um, I'm not saying that there are not ITU member states who are not using the ITU as a platform to pursue more government-centric uh, approaches to internet policy. So, so, but I think we can fight those two battles at the same time. And, and then secondly, I think the issue for me really is that we, we, we're talking about the real issue is, is, is not so much convergence between internet and telecoms. I think the real challenge is market regulation and how do you, on this horizontal layer that everyone still talks about, the transport layer, the content layer, application layer, etc. The real issue is that we have companies that are operating vertically across all those layers and, and, and market regulation structures are not yet able to really cope with that effectively. And, and consumer interest groups are not really able to cope with that effectively. And I think that is the issue that we really should be talking about. And it's kind of, it, it sits on top of this concern about convergence. But I think if we don't actually look at it from that perspective, we'll be having a debate that is kind of almost a non-debate, or soon will be. Thank you. Well, I wouldn't want to have a non-debate. That'd be kind of boring. But I do want to ask some, some questions uh, around the, this topic anyway. 
uh, because there are things that bothered me. So I'm, I'm going to start with, for example, uh, the point you mentioned about the role of the ITU is one that comes back to me again and again because I think back to these conversations I had with policymakers. So the ITU treaty instruments define telecommunications as any transmission, emission, or reception of signs, signals, writing, images, or sounds, or intelligence of any nature by wire, radio, optical, or other electronic, electromagnetic system. And a telecommunications service as the offering of a telecommunication capability between telecom offices or stations of any nature, that one's easier, that are in or belong to different countries. So um, I'm just curious how the people on this panel view this question. To what extent do these uh, definitions apply to the internet, as many governments apparently believe? If, if they do not apply, on what grounds do they not apply? Does the internet not provide for transmissions, emissions of signals, signs, intelligence, yada, yada? Um, so what would be the argument there about this? Because really, as I say, many governments uh, convince the view that indeed the ITU is the natural place for these things, and yes, it's fully within our mandate. So Avi, you're shaking your head, so I'm going to start with you. The, I thought I had this on. I do have this on. Um, I think, first of all, uh, there was a point in making a definition so broad at some point in ancient history that it can cover just about anything in the universe uh, can't in any way be binding on new inventions. So, uh, so for that, I would sort of say, so when I look at those regulations, I look at them in terms of what they were meant to discuss, and that was the notion of telephony. They were defining a notion of telephony. So that's why I argued that when a telephony communications company wants to layer its telephony system on top of IP, certainly they still fall in that because it is telephony being overlaid on anything. When, however, but that, mean, that doesn't mean it applies to the internet, which is an entirely different set of services that, that have nothing to do with telephony, even if one of the services happens to be a voice service. So that's why I indeed made the, the, the division that I do. If it's, if it's um, you know, a, a, a country's telecommunication system that is the telephony system that is provided to the country, and they're overlaying it over IP, but not the internet. And that's one of the things that we often mix up is whether we're using IP protocols on a completely separate set of cables or, or virtual wires versus the internet where we are working within sort of the open governance system. Just to press you, um, you're, you're saying that, that the definition is archaic and so on and, and was, was written with telephone in mind. But the ITU uh, people will all tell you that this applies fully to data communications and did for decades. I mean, back, if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, ITU was developing standards for data communications. They weren't widely deployed. Um, but, you know, and through the, the public switch, the data networks, and on and on and on, X.25, and they see that that is all fully within the scope of this definition. Sure, they have an expansive definition of, of things they would like to control. The point is the Internet is a separate thing that is different from that. And, 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 and just because someone says that because you once used it over our system, it therefore is forevermore a telephony system does not make it so. Okay, I'm looking for the strong basis to, to respond to the government people who believe this is perfectly adequate. Um, yes, Fiona? So I think, um, and I, I have to go back and look at the research that we did going into Wicked, but it'd be interesting to sort of trace the definitions in the ITU context. They don't start with tele, tele, telecom, they start with telegraph. Right. And the definition that you read out is, if, if I remember correctly, pretty consistent with the telegraph definition. Sure. The only things that were added were electromagnetic and optical and, Intelligence. and, and yeah, everything. So this definition is from the 1980s. So how can it apply to today's world? I mean, just as a matter of practical. So like the US Constitution, it's just outdated. 
again, you have to look at how things were developed. The internet was not developed through government involvement and government networks and government owned companies in the same way the telephone system was, or telegraphs were as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I see people in the audience already ready to get me in. I'm perfectly willing to bring the audience in immediately, but let me just see if there's... We have the chair of the IATF here. You must have some thoughts about this. I mean, my God. If anybody should, you should. Yeah, I, I actually agree mostly with what Aubrey said, and I, I um, sort of go, go back to the shipping lane example maybe as, as well. So, I mean, people can have opinions about, you know, that, that they have a, a definition or, or significance uh, beyond what, what, what they were originally working on, but, but, you know, I don't think the rest of the world should necessarily um, heed to that, that uh, claim uh, just like that. I mean, there you know, could be a... I'm sure there's a, like a um, car regulation, regulatory framework, and since cars now communicate uh, through the internet, and then we can make the argument that ah, the car industry and the, the you know regulatory framework there needs to somehow affect also the internet. But that's not the case. We we, we would you know throw out such a ridiculous claim I immediately. Um, but the one area where I would actually disagree with Avi a little bit is is that you talked about telecommunication services such as voice on top of the internet being di directly applicable to, to the regulation. I, th I agree with that largely, but at the same time, we have to recognize that, that, that the voice service as such also is evolving dramatically. So if it used to be you know, the, the you know, PSTN and, and mobile voice servicing, and then we had you know, the Skypes and you know, the, um, services like that, and that, now we're getting into a world where we have WebRTC, and basically every web server is capable of becoming a voice provider. Now, when you go from a couple of players into millions of players, certainly the situation changes. So, I mean, I, I think that, and, and that that's maybe something that the ITU and the regulatory frameworks needs to take into account. So it's not static. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Michaela, and then we're going to go out into the audience. I see Frederick Burr and uh, Chris Myers and Boyd. We're going to have fun here. Okay. But I'm still stuck on the existential point, okay? Yet, if, if the argument is just this is an old definition that some guys grew up in the day of Bismarck, and it therefore it doesn't apply, that isn't so compelling to some governments. So, I mean, there are plenty of governments in Dubai saying perfectly vital, vibrant principle here that captures what the Internet does. We have a mandate to work in the Internet. Look at all the opinions we've adopted on the Internet. Look at all of the standards we're involved in. It all goes back to our mandate, and our mandate is here. We do telecom, and why is that Internet not that? And so if I just tell them, well, that's an old definition, they won't buy that as an argument. So I'm just looking for firepower here from you guys. Okay, Mikhail. Uh, yes, but one, just one quick point. I, I, I think I agree with what has, what has just been said, and I agree with your point as well. Um, maybe where we have to keep separate here is should the definition be reviewed and to what extent? And then the question is to what extent is the ITU or any other worldwide agency entitled or empowered to take decisions and make definition on new things that happen in the world? Whatever, anything, whatever new happen in the world, like the internet for example, are international agencies empowered and to what extent by governments to make definitions, that's the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second separate area is, uh, what are the risks associated? It's a different thing. No, I think no one can argue around the world that the government cannot take a decision over what happens in the world. That's the first point. Mm -hmm. What are the risks associated? Like, I do remember before the wiki, I don't want to get into the wiki discussion at all, as I, I told you before. Told you <laughs> the wiki. No, but I do remember, like, before the wiki, there was this huge campaign of Google uh, urging uh, and wanting to inform people of what was going to happen in Dubai. And I think it was a very well done campaign, but the question I raised myself was, okay, are they really arguing that there are risks associated to it, or, the, or are they arguing that an international agency can take decision on something, which is very two different levels. Mm -hmm. That's very important from my point of view. I think, I, I think most people in that coalition are making the first argument. 
But, um, okay, I want to start to bring some people in here. I see Frederic from the, please uh, uh, identify yourself for the transcript when you make an intervention. And of course, let's keep them concise. Let's take several comments from the audience and then come back to the panel again. <coughs> so starting with uh, Frederic, please. Yes, good morning. I'm Frederic Pierre from Ofcom Switzerland. And uh, I represent the Swiss government in the ITU too. Uh, for me, it's quite clear. Uh, Telecom and internet is very different things. When we speak about telecom, we speak about infrastructure, we speak about uh, technology, economy related to these technologies, and when we speak internet, for me it's related to the content. Yeah. And of course, the problem is, and not only for Switzerland, but uh, for uh, all, most of, uh, of all other European countries, that uh, ITU is only responsible for the infrastructure, for the technology, but not at all for the content. If we want to discuss in an international organization about content, we discuss that in UNESCO, but not in ITU. And the problem is a wicked. There was a tendency in Dubai to put some item about content. And that's the reason that the European doesn't uh, sign um, this uh, uh, treaty, because we are not ITU as dealing with content. It's so simple. Uh, there is, is so much big difference. When we speak about content, it's another word. We have problem with uh, uh, privacy, we have problem with freedom of expression, and other things. And, uh, you know, we don't like that ITU is dealing with that. And uh, our problem was also when ITU try to give advice concerning cyber security. We say, sorry, but cyber security is not technology. Cyber security is also related to very difficult problem. It's a problem between uh, privacy, problem for protect from terrorism, but also respect from uh, the freedom of expression and so on. And sorry, ITU is not ready, has not the competency to, to deal with these uh, with this, uh, uh, items. That's the point, thank you. Okay, so it's a simple matter, it, internet is content. Um, Chris, and then next the gentleman here. Uh, just to help uh, build with some of the, the idea of the, the, the overage. Please uh, identify yourself. Oh yeah, Chris Marsden, University of Sussex. Um, for people remotely and, and others. Um, it's a really great panel. There should be far more people in the audience, but I guess there's some fatigue setting in. So just on the extension of definitions, I and mean, obviously one can extend definitions forward. I always start teaching my classes with Edison, an attorney general of the UK, which extends telegraphy to telephony in 1880. So under a common law system, we're very used to doing that. So there's nothing to... I don't think I'm particularly stopping the ITU from doing what it wants to, but I just want to, uh, a couple of problems that I think emerge. Um, and everyone knows that I talk a lot about net neutrality, and clearly conversions, net neutrality is where the weather hits below very much on these issues. And one of the problems we have, of course, is that when we talk about uh, telecom, service, uh, telecom services being extended into the internet, then one of the issues that's really a, a burning issue right now is how one defines specialized services, I, IP services not on the open internet, uh, which may of course be a route for telecom companies to achieve a, a, an actual very extensive deregulation of their services by avoiding both net neutrality regulation and telecom regulation, which would be a real double whammy for those people who want to see uh, telecom services not controlling uh, traffic that's, uh, that's over their uh, legacy copper and, uh, and fiber. But there's two other things that I think are really interesting here, which, which maybe some other people want to comment on. But the first is the, the danger that we get regulation being imposed from other directions, which may actually be more corporately captured than even in the ITU is. So I'm thinking, I know there's a lot of debate from the European parliamentarians about HTML5 and what that means and what W3C's legitimacy is to be engaged in some quite um, dramatic re-engineering of our, our, our web experience, for instance. And, you know, if we're going to kick the ITU, let's think about kicking the W3C as well, perhaps. And the second is the fact that a lot of telecom companies are very keen to, uh, to move ahead very fast with carrier grade uh, uh, NAT, uh, uh, network address translation, rather than moving to IPv6. And whether or not this is a really significant issue 
um, showing that we really are hidebound by our old telecom way of controlling things. Uh, I know the British Telecom is, is particularly keen on carriage right now because they seem to like the idea that they can do network level uh, control of the user experience rather than moving towards IPv6. So I think there are really significant regulatory issues that remain here. Um, and I'd be interested to get comments. Thanks, Chris. IPv6 is a whole other can of worms. That if, we, if we go there, we'll never solve my my existential problem with the definition. Um, the gentleman in front, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Heavy. I'm from the local operators in Indonesia. Uh, to my understanding, is the, the, what the people need is the ability to communicate to each other globally, whether they can share or communicate using voice, data, and also video. And to be able to do that, now they have two uh, uh, alternative to do that. First, through the internet protocol services, IP services that we call internet, and using application on top of the internet network, and also using the traditional protocols. So they can do the communication through that way. But then, under the current situations, the business term and also the business model is not supporting the telco operators to deploy a massive network. We, we do understand that without a net, telco networks, there will be no global connection internet for internet. So the telco network is become enabler to be able to the, the floating application and also further move, move forward uh, towards applications uh, or provisions of the global internet services. So now the key issue is how we can have a uh, fair business models and also for regulations to enhance or to support their cooperators to provide massive and more global networks. So this will become an effort too in the development of the internet services. Because if you know current uh, the telco regime or current telco regulations, they will prevent the telco to compete directly with the internet services. Telco operators cannot to be confronted and to face in, uh, to compete with the internet services because these is two different kind of things and two different kind of business game. In telco, if you get to communicate with other tech operators, you have to pay interconnection fee. That one is not happens in the internet. So, so these two different things, in, in my opinion, telco more on the positions to profit enable, to become enable for the uh, to the possibility of the. Uh, assistance of the global internet services. Mm -hmm. Thanks. These economic issues are really important. I want to come back to them like in the next question. Uh, I just want to try, I'm going to take one more shot at seeing if I can nail down the specific point. Ah, we have clarity for our three real quick interventions. Uh, so, Madame and then here. And Sam Paltridge, you, you must undoubtedly have a thought or two on the, the relationship. Even though you didn't raise your hand, I've been told you just think about it. If you would like to shed some light, the OECD has certainly done enough work in this realm to be helpful, but uh, if you don't want to, that's fine. Okay, but can we get the camera, uh, the, the talking stick to this young lady? Hi, I'm Laura Casper from Global Partners UK. I, I have a question for the panel. Uh, it's not an intervention, but a, a question. Something that the gentleman before um, mentioned about cybersecurity being discussed in the ITU. Uh, I'm actually curious uh, what the panel thinks about where we should discuss cybersecurity or what the appropriate venue to discuss it is. Um, at the moment, there are a number of processes that are very close that discuss cybersecurity within the first committee of the General Assembly, um, the London process. Um, if not the ITU, then where do we go to address this issue? Thanks. Okay, that's really off my question, but that's an important one. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman here, yeah? He's had his hand for a while. Nobody wants to help you figure out the definition of tough photos. Who's it? Do you got it down? You, you might be getting help from the wrong place. Uh, uh -huh. My name is Dan McGarry. I work with the Pacific Institute of Public Policy. Uh, we work throughout the Pacific Islands region, and uh, for the last decade or so, I've been involved in trying to get us basically from zero, from no telecommunications, no communications technologies, generically speaking, to modern internet. Uh, we're still a long way away, but if I can offer a bit of a polemical 
um, response to the question that you've done. Um, the monarchy uh, in the UK, as it exists under constitutional law, is quite similar today to what it was a century ago or even two centuries ago. Um, definitions may not change. The political manifestation of these definitions emphatically do change. So I'm 100% with Avri in, in, in that regard. Um, and I think that's probably the best example that we, can, that we can use. Yeah, we make up definitions all the time. Um, the way in which we apply the definitions is really the key. And to my mind, um, I, I, I love these conferences and there, there are any number of technical issues that I find endlessly fascinating. Um, but let's be quite frank here and admit that what we're dealing with is a political issue. All the definitions, all the terminology in the world aren't going to save us from the fact that this is a power play. And it's quite a simple one. Um, there are, in, in fundamentally, <laughs> the way it manifests itself is, is, is vastly complex and that's why we have this screaming disagreement across numerous fora. Um, but the bottom line is, do we control communications and whether we get to, and who gets to do it if they do, you know? The telecommunications companies are facing a choice of either moving forward, expanding, you know, and, and embracing, continuing to embrace the definition as you've stated it, or be becoming completely commoditized and becoming utilities, which is anathema, I should think, if I were sitting on the board of any telecoms company. So, all I want to say really is while we're at this, you know, I, I, like I say, I, I love the details, I love the technical stuff, but let's not ever forget that when the negotiations happen, that's not going to be the conversation. The conversation... But, but it was. Well, that would be the... <laughs> if, you look at the if you look at the verbiage, sure. Okay. But let's, you know, let's remember that essentially what we're talking about is a lot of people disaffected with the, the state of things. A lot of people seeing a threat mm -hmm. either to their opportunities or to their continued sure. control over certain sectors. Um, and if we don't pull that subtext into the fore, we'll just have another series of wickets. Okay. That was not too political. Uh, I, I want to come back to our panelists here who are now getting itchy, but the, the gentleman here in the front has been waving for a while, so I know you're going to resolve that question. I, I've got the feeling. So you asked, Christopher, you're from the University of Pennsylvania. You asked, to what extent should this be governed by old language? And the question is, what extent does legality matter and the words matter? It does matter. This is an active fight in the U.S. The predominant question is, uh, how did the statutory language passed in 1934 and amended in 1996 directly affect jurisdiction of the Internet, which has direct implications? I think that politics clearly matters in terms of playing this out, but the legal, the legal background in front of which that happens is vitally important. Um, Fiona's right, there are certain texts that are designed to be more open-ended than others. Uh, the definitions embodied, for example, in U.S. law are not among them. They're very precise, verbose, designed to get at something. And the problem is, is how, how they apply to the Internet is largely an accident because no one had this particular technology in mind. And the other question is, is it a cable service? Is it, you know, there are all these very specific questions. It may apply accidentally, but in fact, courts will literally apply the language and find out whether they fit. And it ends up being rather procrustean. You know, just chop off whatever, you look at how the words fit on there. And there's been an active uh, legislative discussion in the U.S. is whether we need to create a new title to govern the Internet to actually um, think through, and one of the advantages we've had up to this point is we've unmoored from the previous definitions by declaring it to be a Title I action, which is a term of art, that basically allowed the agency to make up its own regulatory regime, and that is, smart money says, about to end in the U.S. because they don't believe that's valid. So in answer to your question, the words, the old words, don't answer anything that is about interpretation, but do provide the background of what courts will do. And if you shift to the ITU, we have a different decision-making body where they're going to apply the, uh, the scope of the ITR 
And normally it's jurisdiction by consent in international law, but people who sign the treaty and they interpret the literal terms of the ITR will go through the dispute resolution mechanisms of the ITU and come up with a resolution based on what they decide. And literally on words being applied in a context that were not intended and may create some results that other people may not like. The definition is also in the Constitution, right? So. Yes, also, um, the IT is somewhat different. It's not the same as the court system. There isn't a dispute resolution mechanism. So what you're talking about with the ITRs is if you sign the ITRs, then incorporating them into your national law. So if the United States had signed the ITRs, then the State Department would have delegated authority to the FCC or whatever uh, appropriate regulatory group to actually implement them. And that's what happened with accounting rates and things like that. So it's a little bit different because you're talking about an international consensus but local implementation. Um, but while I have the microphone, all this conversation about a definition, you can't have an isolation of what's the definition for. And that's why the discussions of definitions are problematic. You can't mm -hmm. just say, oh, that definition is okay from the 1880s or from the 1950s or from now. It's what are you going to use it for? And this is, I think, a lot of what the argument is about at Wicked or in the IT or other places. The IT is a good institution. It does good things on spectrum. We shouldn't, you know, you ignore that part. The reality from our perspective, though, is that when we want to talk about Internet policy and Internet issues, we'd like it to be in a place that reflects how the Internet was created and developed, mm -hmm. not, you know, in an institution that's only government only. It's one of the reasons we were very much against the Internet proposal going into Wicket and things like that. It's not the right venue to have some of these conversations. I understand. I just, just hung up on how to respond to the government people who were saying to me, look, I think this covers it. So there's not a problem for me. But, and thank you for using Procrustean in the sentence. Doesn't that, <laughs> does not happen very often. We have two other people that have been waiting a long time, then I want to come back to the panel, then I want to switch. So sorry, the gentleman back there, I know you had your hand up for a long time. And then Parminger. Uh, thank you. My name is Andrew Sullivan, and I don't speak for anyone. Um, the, I, I want to thank the panel for this discussion. I, I, I'm, ho I'm a hopeless geek, right? So I can't tell you what the political realities of this are. But um, uh, in terms of the, uh, of the definitional foundation, I think this, this relates to uh, Aubrey's opening remarks and uh, uh, Fiona's remarks just now. And that is, uh, the, the reason this definition looks like it applies to the internet is a category mistake. The, the definition that we have in uh, of, of telecommunications that underlies the ITU uh, actually creates an international system. Before you have uh, this definition of, of telecommunications, you don't have an international telecommunications system at all because we have our national systems that need to be interconnected in some way and, and maybe bilateral agreements. But you don't have an international system whatsoever. The IP network didn't get created that way. The IP network gets created by voluntary routing of packets between networks that um, connect to one another. It's an internet. And because it's a voluntary network, by definition, it is not created by this um, by this creation that is embedded in that definition. So that's the reason that this definition doesn't apply to the internet. The internet stands outside of that international system that is created by this um, by this definition. That's the only thing I wanted to say about it. That is most certainly true about the second definition I wrote about telecom service offering of the capability between stations, etc. Permanter. I'm Brian Linder from NGRT for Change. Uh, I think the definition question is important, but uh, at a subsidiary level to the fact that there is an internet, whether it's inside telecom definition or outside, and we need to know what needs to be done uh, about what needs to be done about it. It, and to that extent, I wonder how much of this thing at Wicked was converting the U.S. struggles over whether uh, the internet should be regulated and the telecom company saying that now we are all IP and the, the conversation well needs no regulation at all and everything is redefined, whether, whether that was being transferred to with it that the communication well itself so does not need any kind of uh, regulation. So my point is, and it's been raised earlier here in different ways, is that it's not important what the definition is. Either the internet is regulated, I, will, I don't know, the words get infested with the wrong meanings, but whatever the governance around it has to be done either inside the ITU or outside it. And it's, it's not a problem whether it's inside the outside, in the ITU or outside, as long as we know that if it's not inside the ITU, where does the global governance of those kind of things get done outside the ITU within the global space? And that is a global discussion. And, and 
I'm, I'm happy either way. I mean, I'm, I don't like IT because it's a private sector government coalition since long, and that's my primary problem. And to just end, I have to do the very unpleasant task of pointing out that this is a global discussion, and we could fail partly because a global model of certain thinking was being imposed, uh, a kind of a Western model was being imposed on a global system. And I'm happy to see that there's a panel which just consists of people from the North. I'm not even counting the nationalities from the US on the panel. And that really, in our IGF conversation, is not what we need to do. I and mean, the point is that we could crashed because there wasn't a meeting of mind and we need to have a dialogue and I also wonder how this kind of parallel composition passes the max stringent conditions of diversity. So nothing personal here but I keep on raising the point hoping that someday the diversity would improve. Sorry. Thank you. Well the diversity is a function of who was able to come, Prime Minister, number one. The number of people dropped out of the panel and so on. We didn't even know if this event was going to be held. So it was very difficult to recruit people and keep them on. Secondly, Anya is from South Africa, which I believe is in the Global South. Um, but in either way, um, I, I take the first point that uh, there are some interesting questions there. Now, uh, let's go back to the panel uh, and for thoughts on now we've put all these wonderful juicy things on the table about uh, whether it, what it all means and whether any of it matters. Uh, Yari, what do you think? Yeah, I, I just wanted to go back to um, uh, the, the comment from the gentleman on the, on the front on, you know, that this is a power play rather than, you know, discussion of, of the definitions and that, that's absolutely right. So, I mean, this is important stuff. This has real world consequences and, and we're arguing about legalistic definitions from, you know, from some texts from way back. It, it, it seems somewhat silly. Um, but you also said um, that, that you think this is, you know, the choices are either moving forward and sort of embracing the, the, the more extended definition or, or you know, uh, be in danger of being commoditized. And um, I, I, there I'd like to disagree very much. So um, I, I think by and large the industry has realized, you know, what, what's happening and has already moved on and is healthy. Um, and you don't actually have to control, you know, the, the business and the, or the value chain end to end as the telecoms industry traditionally has in order to make money. Um, just to give you some examples, a, a, a while ago, the, the average revenue per user uh, from PSP and services in, in Finland was smaller than the average revenue from, say, a DSL connection. And you know, sure, the, the technology has changed dramatically on the service that you provide, but it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to provide the service and do it profitably. And um, I mean, that, that is basically what, what, what the users want. They want more, more bits and there's certain competition on, you know, you know, where can you provide the service and what areas and how fast and what quality and m many other things. So, so I mean, the world has become more complicated, so there's different roles now. It's not just one role. But, but there's this access role, role and other roles in content providers and such. Um, and we have to recognize that. Uh, uh, no, just I wanted to take up again on the point raised by, um, I don't remember your name, but anyway, here in the front row. Um, I, I guess your point about uh, definitions um, as they are written black and white, and the political dimension of it is definitely the right thing we have to look at. Um, how and to what extent uh, are we looking at convergence? Because I thought that was the theme of the um, of the of the panel today. Um, how do we look at convergence? How can can we define services, telecom services, or internet services? Is it worth doing it? And what's the political uh, intention uh, of looking at how things are moving on and how the internet is developing, which was exactly the point I was making at the beginning, which was like, and I, I was making the same point, by the way, yesterday, speaking on a panel on net neutrality, which was what are we talking about? Let's try to define two or three main issues, concrete points, how do we want to approach them, and how can the way out or the solutions be beneficial to everybody. 
Like if I look at, in, in my office in Brussels, I've got a book with the EU telecom regulation, it's this big, and I think it's, I don't know, probably a thousand pages, but I think it's work in a political way, and people, consumers, NGOs, companies, um, want to get the best out of it. So if we speak of convergence, what do we mean? Is an international organization entitled to make, a to make a definition and take decisions over something that is happening in the world that is wonderful, that is at the internet, but what do we do about that? Chris, it's the, it's the member states that do that, not the, the organization, right? Yeah. And they take it upon themselves that they do have that ability. But that said, um, well, okay, I think I feel a little bit empowered when next time I have this conversation. I, I, the IT is currently trying to define uh, information communication technology. That's been going on for a couple of years. We'll see whether the Plenty Pot decides to come back and think about telecom, but I, I kind of doubt it. I want to return to, Her was it Harry from the, was that your name, Harry, the, from the, um, the agency? Right, right, the money stuff. Um, at the end of the day, uh, as has been pointed out, the definitions matter because it ties into everything else, and that's in particular the cash. And what uh, Wicket had a lot to do with was money. Um, and not just Wicket, but the, the, the larger lay of the land and the relationship between telecom and internet, money is all over the place. Telcos and ISPs in many regions have raised grave concerns about their financial prospects and the ability to invest in broadband rollout uh, do the distribution of costs and benefits ac across network providers and users. Um, just recently, uh, uh, Louis G Gambadella, uh, Michaela's boss, gave an interview. He's the head of Edno, uh, and he said, "Don't worry, you're not, you're not out of line." Uh, in which he said, "There's a desperate need to establish a real level playing field between OTT services and telecom services, which will ensure that nobody enjoys unfair competitive advantages." and that consumers can enjoy the same rights when using these services, okay? Well, uh, again, uh, you know, during the wicked and uh, just more generally, the question of who's paying and who's benefiting in terms of the relationship between the underlying providers of transmission and uh, the folks that are sending services over them has been a hot one. And you talk to a lot of people in developing country governments who say, all this stuff comes in from Google. You know, my people watch YouTube, and we have to pay to suck all those bits through the pipe. Uh, this is unfair to us. You know, some means of solving this must be found. So there's a real issue there from the standpoint of some players, even if perhaps for others that's a misframing of the problem. Um, and then there's the interconnection questions, and uh, whether the existing model of interconnection among private uh, Entities uh, through contracts, um, you know, uh, should be different in some manner. Uh, so the many aspects of the, the, the Internet environment and its relationship to telecom are certainly at the forefront of a lot of people's thinkings. I'm just curious if people have some thoughts about that. I see in the audience here somebody who would like to make, make an observation, and I will look to the panel for... Is there, could you get the, cat, the uh, stick to her? Uh, is there anybody else who would like to get on, on this point? Henriette and then the gentleman in the front. Lee from BCS, but I'm not speaking with my BCS hat. Um, I was uh, IT director in EMI, um, and that's a music company, as many people will know. Its original work was, uh, you know, and business model was to find artists and make money out of them in live shows and producing vinyl records. I went through the era where we went from vinyl to tape. We thought that was great. We sold the um, content a second time in a new medium. And then even better, we went from that to CD, sold it for a third time. Um, and we were very, very profitable. Then suddenly we couldn't stop the pirating of those things and we couldn't stop the data streaming and the company has gone bankrupt, um, has been taken over. Um, the reality that the ITU is not prepared to uh, admit and companies being disrupted by the internet have got to accept is that 
you have to change your business model um, with the technology that is available at the time. And if you don't, you, you will die. It's like bricks and clicks in, in, in retail. Um, and I think that the music model is a very salient one to the discussion that you're having. Thank you. Um, we'll come to you in a second, Mekana, but I want to get the audience people first. Uh, Henriette, she's not really an audience member, but she's sitting out there. And by the way, if there's any remote participation comments, please convey those to me. I'm you. checking. We have two. We have Judith Hellerstein and Inez Martinez, but neither of them are wanting to ask questions at this, at this point. Okay. And just for the record, they're following the transcript. They're actually having difficulty with following the, the Webex, but, but the mm -hmm. transcript is coming through. Mm -hmm. But it's fine. No problem. Don't worry. Um, I think, Bill, your question is actually similar to, to Parminda's question, you know, and, and Michele's question do international organizations have the right to make these definitions? I mean, and, and I, think, I think there are issues that developing countries feel are not being addressed. I think, Michele, in a simple way, the answer to your question is obviously yes. But I think in the case of the ITU, it becomes a yes, but. And I think that is the, the difficulty. And just to take the example that, that they mentioned, which is about the, 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 the cost to the telecommunications networks of massive content being downloaded from Google, et cetera, et cetera. And now, now that is a problem, but restricting it um, is not the answer. In fact, as we said in our advocacy around the wicket, is that some of these large companies, internet companies, would, would simply cut a whole country off if it doesn't represent um, a lot of revenue rather than have to pay for, for traffic downloads. So the user interest there is not served by the type of approach that some developing countries were advocating for, but that doesn't mean that the problem does not exist. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's one issue. And I think that the other thing is that what we have in the ITU is, 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 is the old telecommunications approach where, where member states and where national telcos are still looking for sources of revenue and they're looking at the internet as a potential source of revenue. So, and it's a practice that is not necessarily going to help users at all. In fact, it could harm them. So, so, so the question is making a yes. I think it's legitimate. But the ITU, as it's constituted at the moment and operates at the moment, is not necessarily a reliable uh, entity from a civil society perspective. I also think some of the most concerning things that the ITU is doing is, is the cyber crime discussions and um, the child protection. The, the work being done and the guidelines that are being issued by the ITU on child protection completely disregards freedom of expression and freedom of association. So, so for me, that's where the real issues are lying. But, um, just in response to that, I think the other thing that people tend to ignore when they have the discussion about the ITU is that at national level this convergence is happening. National regulators in many countries are regulating the internet and are regulating internet content. So, um, so we, we, we talk about you know not having stuff happen at the ITU when in fact within the ITU universe that stuff is happening at national level and not necessarily in a good way. Sometimes, yes, sometimes when it's a strong regulator that can actually regulate the market, uh, regulate interconnection and, and roaming charges well, it can have good outcomes. If it's one that interferes too much with content, it has bad outcomes. And um, I think what I want to, to, to just ask, and maybe, maybe it's a terribly naive civil society perspective, um, but isn't it possible to identify the area of overlap, the area where there's a need for more cooperation, and not necessarily change the mandate, uh, but have some protocol or some procedure for more collaboration between the telecommunications regulation universe and this internet non-regulation universe. Um, for example, just as a, as a devil's advocate type, for, uh, type of example, IPv6. You know, every internet conference I come to, I have to hear the NROs complain about IPv6 not being taken up. And I hear it again and again, and Vince Cerf says it when he goes to church, he says it when he goes to the movies, Vince Cerf talks about IPv6 whenever he talks. Um, but but what, to me, this sounds like 
market in regulatory intervention. This sounds like a problem that can and should be solved for some form of regulatory intervention. So I, I see I've been putting a whole six, uh, terrified face. But isn't there a way in which some kind of one-off agreement on a particular particular kind of regulatory intervention, not necessarily just with the ITU, maybe with uh, some other regulatory level. So. So that's really what I'm saying. Can't we sometimes work together with, across the two un these two universes when it can actually benefit users? I will stop scaring the audience. That's a bad thing. Uh, just quick, because I'd like to come back to the point. Yeah, uh, very, very quickly. I just wanted to clarify that um, in the discussions that I've had, and it's in a small area representing a very small population, I've never heard an economic argument concerning the influx of data. It's usually based on social mores um, more than anything else. Uh, so I, I don't know whether that, it, it seems to me at any rate, when that argument came out, you know, the old sender pays um, thing, it seemed to me like a construct and a rather artificial thing just based on my own experience. The uh, other thing I wanted to come back on really quickly was my point about commodification. Um, we, developing nations, especially least developed nations, face extreme economic stringencies. You know, we're, we're really working under straightened circumstances. In the Pacific, the, the geography is horrendous when it comes to, you know, cost per capita to roll out infrastructure. Um, that's the context that, uh, that, uh, that, from which that comment was made. I, I'm sure that uh, Europe, significant parts of Asia, North America, and even significant parts of South America would not look at all the same. Um, but just be advised that there is, you know, there are parts of the world where this is a, a really significant issue. Thanks.